it's such a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak at this very important session today. Uh, I will start by just dealing with some definitions. I know that a lot of you will be aware of melanoma and may be very well educated, but there may be some newcomers. And so just so that you understand the language that I'll use, when I say lesion, I mean a spot on the skin. Nevis is a term, which we, is a medical term, and it really means it's the same as a mole. Dysplastic nevus is where a pathologist sees some changes in the cells under the microscope, but it's not a melanoma. And then primary melanoma is the malignant mole or lesion on the skin. Secondary melanoma is where the cells have spread to a site away from the primary melanoma. The term lymph gland is the same as lymph node, and there are collections of nodes and glands in the armpit, axilla, groin, and neck. And prognosis is a term we use where we're making an assessment as to the risk to the patient uh, or the person that the melanoma may not come back or may come back. So let's just look at the anatomy of the skin first in relation to melanoma. And the skin's made up of a number of layers. The epidermis, which includes the basal layer, the dermis, which has two layers, the papillary and reticular dermis, and the subcutaneous layer, which is fat. Melanoma in the past has been described in levels, one to five, as you see. Probably the most important level for you to know about is level one. Now, this is a melanoma that's contained in the epidermis, the superficial layer. There's no blood vessels and no lymph channels there, so this should be cured with excision. You'll hear a bit more about level four because it gets confused with stage, stage four. So level one or in situ melanoma, it's not invading deep and is cured with excision. Level four just means it's deeper and has a little worse outcomes compared to level two and level three. But when we look at prognosis or risk to a person, the most important things are the thickness of the melanoma that's measured by the pathologist under the microscope. And this was first described by Breslow, uh, a pathologist. The, whether the old melanoma has ulceration, whether it's spread to lymph nodes, or whether it's spread to other organs. And this is all about the stage of disease. So when we look at primary melanoma and we talk about the thickness, the pathologist has looked at the micro, under the microscope. They've measured from the top of the melanoma or where there may be ulceration to the base, and then they give us a thickness. And this is split up into four groupings. As you see, less than one, one to two millimeters, two to four greater than four. And then this is split also with respect to whether there's ulceration or not. And as you go down this cascade from T1 to T4, the risk that the melanoma may come back or create problems in the future gets higher. We then stage the melanoma and stage one and stage two are all related to the primary melanoma, the melanoma on the skin, as I just outlined with the thickness. Stage three is when it's moved to lymph glands and stage four is when it's spread to other organs. Just briefly about level and stage, just to remind you, level is the anatomy of the skin. So level four is just where it is in the skin. Stage four is when it's spread to organs. So immediately you understand there's a big difference. And I have to say that some of some uh, uh, inexperienced GPs get level and stage mixed up as well, not just patients and you'll Google stage four when somebody said level four to you and it'll just scare you. So when we look at thickness, you can see that the majority of melan pa patients who have a melanoma, less than one millimeter, and that's 70% of the people we see do very well. And then the risk that there will be problems increases as things get thicker. And this is a large series out of Queensland reported by my colleague Adele Green. When we look at diagnosis, it's quite handy to use the A, B, C, D, and E, looking at asymmetry, the border, which is often uneven, different colors within a, a, le in a, a lesion, or the diameter, usually larger, but none of these things are perfect, whether it's elevated, but probably just as important is whether there's been any recent change. And it's really important to know that 15 to 20% of melanomas are not pigmented. So it's a guide, but it's not the answer. So that any changing lesion or mole, 
not definitely diagnosed as being benign should be excised or if if that if complete excision can't be done it should at least be biopsied for the pathologist to assess so if we give you some examples on the on the left hand side is a benign nevus or mole very symmetrical and on the right hand side is a melanoma almost looks like africa and this and we have different classifications this is a flat superficial spreading melanomas nodular melanoma which you can see on the right hand side is not pigmented and on the left hand side there's a small brown mole and then there's a melanoma that's developed in the mole and this is a mole that a melanoma that's occurred in very sun damaged skin lentigo malignant melanoma and that's commonly found in sun damaged skin and this type of melanoma is found on the soles of the feet palms of the hands or in the nail beds and it's very rare about one percent of the melanomas that we see and these are examples of melanoma without pigment but the important thing here is that these lesions were changing and the change even though they weren't pigmented led to removal or biopsy so when we see or there there's a suspicious lesion the aim is for it to be completely excised pathologists want to look at the whole mole lesion there's no adverse effect for having this cut off and it's very important because it assists us with planning what is the best treatments with respect to surgery and also lymph node treatment some patients it can be very difficult to remove the whole melanoma and so they'll get a, a partial biopsy a shave or a punch biopsy or an incision into the melanoma it's no adverse effects from doing that pathologists would prefer the whole lesion but sometimes as you saw in that, that lesion on the cheek the biopsy needs to be targeted because removing the whole lesion is a really big deal that would require fairly major plastic surgery reconstruction once we've made a diagnosis that it's melanoma if the melanoma is in situ that is the curable superficial type the margin should be about five millimeters and if it's invading then the margin should the minimum should be a centimeter and we consider wider margins up to two centimeters when there's thick melanomas with ulceration and some of the rare subtypes and there's a trial in australia and internationally at looking at one versus two centimeter uh, excision margins particularly for the thicker melanomas over two millimeters so this is an example of a diagnosis this a biopsy had been taken this was a melanoma and this is the excision this is an ellipse so we can get this closed completely and obviously in this case would have been very difficult to close and so this person needed a skin graft when we look at the lymphatic system in our body most of the organs drain to lymph glands deep inside and also on the skin so on the skin the superficial lymph nodes drain to regions the armpit axilla to the groin from the leg and trunk and to the neck from the head and neck so a melanoma may be on the skin that's the primary melanoma and lymph channels will drain from that to a specific lymph node in a group so if that little cluster that you see on the right hand side the first lymph node is called the sentinel node and that might have been in an armpit or a groin or in the neck so at the time of removing the, the mel primary melanoma and doing the wide excision in some patients we look at sampling or removing that draining lymph node it gives us information that's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy we find that with the pathologist injecting radioactive material around the site where the melanoma is diagnosed you can see on the right hand side there are lymph channels draining to three lymph glands and this is in a groin we inject blue dye around the site of the melanoma and then using a mark made by the radiologist we make an incision and we find a blue lymph gland and we have a little geiger counter that confirms that it's active it has radioactivity so when would we consider removing that lymph node the central node biopsy when the lymph node ch the chances of the glands being involved is greater than five percent then it's well worthwhile when we look at the pros and cons of the extra surgery and which group is that and it's the group with slightly higher risk factors so and i've shown you it's some patients with melanomas less than one millimeter and all other patients greater than one millimeter 
could fall into the group that have a potential of having a sentinel node positive in more than 5%. And so that's the group where we look at and discuss it with patients. The biopsy gives us information about prognosis, where you stand, that it, it will, removing that lymph gland would reduce the risk of it coming back in that nodal region. And it's very important. It's the prime importance is staging. And for some patients with thicker melanomas, it, it's very important because that group of people might be able to get extra treatments that Georgina is going to tell us about. When melanoma goes to lymph glands, it could be microscopic, that is in the sentinel node that was positive, or patients can present with a lump in the armpit, groin or neck. And that's where they present with a clinical lymph node. And the treatment then is to remove all the glands in that area because there's a 20 to 25% chance it could be microscopic melanoma in other lymph glands. And the aim is to stop, reduce further disease at that site. And this group will also be considered for extra treatments that Georgina is going to tell us about. In 1963, when the first epidemiology project was set up to look at melanoma in Australia, people were having it removed with five centimetres, like a small dinner plate. They were having all their lymph nodes taken just in case and there was no treatment if it spread. Now we have much smaller no, uh, margins. We do sentinel node biopsy to get information and we can offer people extra treatment that will improve their outcomes and we actually have treatments when it's spread. Things have changed. It's all very well to talk about surgery, but no discussion is complete without acknowledging the importance of prevention and early diagnosis. There's, there are tr studies occurring in Australia now and internationally, but particularly in Australia, looking at identifying those people who are at higher risk of getting a melanoma or those who've had a melanoma of getting another melanoma by looking at the genetic makeup and their, the way they look and the melanoma and the type of skin they have, using 3D photography, looking at uh, 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 but, uh, mobile teledermatoscopy, which is looking at lesions and sending things by mobile phones. All sorts of studies are being done at the moment to try to look at early diagnosis and early interventions with patients. So as I see it in the future, we'll continue public campaigns aiming for prevention. There, haven't been, there hasn't been one for years. We want an early diagnosis and we want to know who we should be looking at very intensively who have got high risk of getting primary melanoma. We want to look at surveillance schedules in those patients. We're using innovative technology and we're looking at what things we can do to try to improve the diagnosis of this disease. Thank you.